I'm Rosa Seb, my name is Dan Fressi. Uh, right now we're doing this project in conjunction with Magma Powertrain uh, on the forming simulation of boron steel. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give a quick introduction of the project, what exactly we're trying to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to get into a quick background on materials just to refresh everyone's second year knowledge of steel. And then I'm going to go into a simulation overview. I'm going to talk about how we set up these simulations and then some of the preliminary results that we have from them right now. And then I'm going to move into the next steps of the project. So, leading in with a quick introduction, uh, we're all engineers, and so we know how big green initiatives have become in today's business world. And of course, the automotive industry is no different, and in fact, it's subject to very, very strict scrutiny. The reason being, 20% of CO2 emissions in our atmosphere are produced by automobiles. And so, because of this, automotive manufacturers are subject to very stringent targets, which they must meet for emissions in particular, and that kind of, that kind of thing. And one of the easiest ways that we can reduce emissions is by reducing fuel consumption. And one of the easiest ways we can reduce fuel consumption is by reducing the mass. So if we look at this graph here, um, this actually shows vehicle model year, and then it has mass, and then it has adjusted fuel consumption. So adjusted fuel consumption is what do you actually see? Your car may claim 32 miles per gallon, but do you get 30? Do you get 28? So that's what this is. This is adjusted for real world. And then we have weight. So we can see that after an initial drop around 1978 in vehicle weight, we've steadily increased. And there's many reasons because of this. Uh, the reason, the main reason is because of increasing uh, mandates on crash worthiness. So the vehicles need to be made stronger in order to meet front impact, side impact, and that kind of thing. And so that typically means using thicker steel or more of it. Um, and unfortunately, because of that, we've had amazing advances in engine efficiency. Even right here, we can see this big jump up. And that's just from going from carburation to fuel injection. Um, but after that, we don't really see too many gains in real-world scenarios due to the fact that we have a steadily increasing amount of vehicle mass. And so currently, our average vehicle weight is typically around the same as what it was in 1975. So if we want to look at very interesting ways, or easy ways for that matter, of reducing vehicle weight, we want to look at the constitutives of what that vehicle is made of. And so the typical automobile, we see it being made of about 60% steel and iron. So if we can take these steel and iron components, replace them with ultra high strength steel components that have been properly optimized to take use of their strength, uh, and achieve maybe a 10% overall vehicle weight reduction, we could achieve up to a 7% decrease in fuel consumption. And so in an environment where we're really fighting for 1 and 2% decreases in consumption, 7% is massive. So right here we have a graph that shows uh, steel strength and shows elongation capability of some common high strength steels. So we have things like transformation-induced plasticity steels, we have dual-phase steels, we have complex-phase steels, and in particular interest to us is Martin-Zedek steels with focus on 22 mmp 5 So as we can see, as the steels tend to get stronger, they do tend to get more brittle. So 22 mmp 5 is what we call typically boron steel. Uh, this just indicates that it's been alloyed with manganese as well as boron. And right now it's the gold standard for ultra-high-strength quenchable steel. So when we receive it, it comes to us in a very low strength and yield state, and this allows us to form it and get much more intricate geometries than we would otherwise. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, and then when, after we quench it, we can get full, very, very high strength out of it. So when we receive it, we get it in about 600 megapascal ultimate tensile strength. And then after quenching, we see strength above 1500 megapascal. So anywhere from a 200 to 300% increase in ultimate tensile strength. Uh, of course, when we get it, we have very different microstructures from when it's been quenched, or from when it's been received to when it's been quenched. Uh, comes in a very verdict prolytic state, and then of course after quenching it should be fully martensitic. So this graph right here shows what we call hot stamping evolution, and what it is, it just shows how many kilotons of output we're seeing with boron steel uh, in different areas. So around even 10 years ago, 2006, no one was using boron steel whatsoever. But around 2007, the Europeans really started to ramp up production. They started to use it more of their luxury class uh, automobiles in order to prevent the increase in weight that's accompanied with better crashworthiness. Um, but of course, they've steadily increased, and, and, and there's a big, big disparity between how much they're using and how much the domestic automotive manufacturers are using. So this represents a very significant um, discrepancy that we need to, to, to fix here. So companies like Volvo and Mercedes and BMW are leading the trend on these, these kinds of things. And so one of the questions I get very commonly when I'm talking about reducing vehicle weight is why not just replace steel with aluminum? And there's many reasons why we wouldn't do that. Number one being that Using steel is less expensive than using aluminum in most cases. Um, it has a higher specific strength than aluminum when we're referring to ultra high strength steels. And the overall process chain to using steel is much cheaper than it is aluminum. So if we look at that, we can see the relative prices of all these different constituents. 
and then we can see the strength. And when we go to boron steel, we would achieve about a 69% higher strength to weight ratio coupled with a 21% decrease in cost. So if we can make this work, it becomes a very attractive option as it pertains to lighting articles. So North America's main lag in production is typically related to the massive startup costs that we see using boron steel. And the reason being is because it's very difficult to form when we're trying to get very intricate geometries. So what we need to do is we need to use a technique called hot forming, or in conjunction with die quenching, in order to form this. So the technique basically involves taking our material, heating it up to over 900 degrees Celsius to achieve full austenization, and then uh, stamping it in actively cool tooling. So that might be a little hard to get your head around, but I have a video here. So when I was doing my work term over the summer at Magna, I have a video from the lab here. So the robotic arm goes into the furnace, it pulls our blank out that's been heated past its ignition temperature, obviously, and then it goes in the, uh, in the tool. This is called a hack tool, and it forms the splines on this particular part. We can see that we have our water cooling channels here, and so this tool is actively cooled. One of the things you may notice is that it's very quick to actually form the part, but the quenching operation takes an extremely long time. So this represents a lot of opportunities that we have to decrease the cycle time, and of course with manufacturing, that's what we want to do. So when it comes out, it has been quenched, it will be at its full temperature, or full strength, uh, but it is still at a couple hundred degrees Celsius, so it's not completely room temperature at this point. So Magma Powertrain is currently trying to implement this material into their transmission components, um, and so that's why we're doing this project. What we're trying to do is we're trying to use nonlinear finite element analysis tech analysis techniques to mitigate as many costs as possible with this, pro uh, this process. So when we do this, it really makes a lot of sense if we center it around one specific project. And in that case, we're using Magnus 2.6 clutch hub. So this component right here is actually a rear wheel drive transmission component. It's cyclically loaded and it's, uh, it spins. So I can't really say too much about it because it is a proprietary component right now, but this is what we're going to be doing our research with. It has very complex geometry, so it's pretty indicative of things we might try and form in the future. So right now I'm going to get into a quick background, just kind of overview second year materials for steel. So as many of you guys may remember, we have six main phases. We have three equilibrium phases being ferrite, austenite, and cementite. And then we have three non-equilibrium phases being perlite, bainite, and martensite. Uh, so of course, we're only going to be seeing these phases on the isothermal phase diagram. Now, a particular interest to us, again, is martensite. So what is martensite exactly? Uh, well, if I can get this video to play. Okay, maybe the video's not short. But anyways, it doesn't really matter. Um, so martensite is the strongest steel phase that we can achieve. Of course, it's the most brittle phase, being hand-to-hand -hand with strength. And of course, it has very low formability because of this. Um, it's what we call metastable. So metastable meaning that it needs to be formed through a time dependency, but once it achieves its state, it'll pretty much remain there indefinitely as long as the environmental conditions don't change substantially, uh, meaning we don't reheat it. So it's formed through quenching, and it's very, very difficult to achieve martensite in standard steel. So the way we achieve martensite when we look at an isothermal phase diagram here is we bring it up somewhere in the austenitic region. It needs to be north of what we call the AC3 temperature, which would be 912 degrees on this specific uh, chart. And then what we do is we rapidly cool it, and we don't allow the carbon to diffuse out. And when we do this, it traps the carbon inside. It makes for a much stronger material. So when we look at a very, very standard mild steel, something you'd see maybe in an auto body, uh, an AISI 1050 steel, we can see why it becomes so hard to get a fully martensitic microstructure. So the equation right over here is essentially just the equation for a slope. All we're trying to do is we're trying to see if we heat our steel up to our AC3 temperature and draw a line straight down on the CCT diagram, <laughs> what slope do we need to clear the bainite nodes where bainite would start to form? So if we do this very simple operation, just calculating slope, we see that we would need a cooling rate of 375 degrees Celsius per second, which is pretty much not achievable at all in die quenching, where we can see maybe 80 degrees Celsius per second, so this won't work. Uh, but by moving to boron steel, we actually can correct this problem. So the boron actually slows the diffusion of the carbon out of the microstructure, and so it really allows us to achieve this at a much slower rate. So we look at the same CCT diagram for boron steel, and we do the same calculation, we see that we only need 27 degrees Celsius per second to achieve full martinization. So it makes it much more feasible to achieve a full martensitic conversion using die function. So current applications for this are things like B-pillars, bumper beams, door rails, and windscreen uprights. And of course, these are all things that are being used to increase the crash worthiness of the vehicle. So this is a BMW 5 Series chassis. And it just goes to illustrate the point of how many different types of ultra-high-strength materials the Europeans are using in their chassis. 
So I'm going to move on to simulation now. Um, of course, as I said before, we're trying to use the finite element analysis technique to mitigate the cost of this process. And so the way FVM works is it discretizes geometries into very small little elements that we call them uh, that we can approximate a solution for. So if we look at this suspension bell crank, it's, mod or it's modeled as a continuum. So I don't have a set of constitutive equations that I can just enter numbers into and then find the stress and strain or any other value at any point. But what I do have is I have equations over which I know results for a tetrahedral or a quadrahedral element. So what I can do is I can discretize all of these, uh, or this whole geometry into little chunks. I can find the solution for each specific element. I can extrapolate that to a global solution. So when we look at trying to simulate cold forming processes or stamping with no heat, that's actually very simple. What we need to do first is, a, is choose an appropriate solver. And these solvers come in two different varieties. We have what's called implicit time solvers and explicit time solvers. Implicit time solvers are what most people here are going to be familiar with. This is something that you'd see in like a static structural analysis. What they're good for is things that it's very easy to achieve conversions with and things where we don't really need to know what the intermediate states are. So something like static structural analysis, uh, where we're only trying to find the end deflection. But explicit time solvers are quite different. What we'd use these things for are things that it's very hard to achieve convergence for or things where the intermediate states are very important. So something like a dynamics analysis. Um, now the industry standard solver for metal forming analysis is LS Dyna, made by Livermore Software Technology Corporation. And they've actually built an implicit and explicit solver into their algorithm. So it has both built into it. And this becomes very important to us later. So die quenching becomes extremely, extremely difficult to simulate. And there's many reasons for that, mainly to do with the fact that we have thermal conditions. But what it comes down to is the fact that with a typical heated problem, maybe you have the mechanical field interacting with the thermal field. But when you start trying to model microstructure evolution with your simulations, you get things such as volumetric changes being induced by the thermal field. And of course, those volumetric changes induce changes in the mechanical field. And things from the mechanical field, such as how much plastic strain we start with, will affect how the microstructure evolves. So what you end up having to do is solve three continuous ordinary differential equations at each implicit and explicit time step, and it causes the model to be very unstable. Uh, so it can be very difficult to get this to work. Now, the way Magnus 2 6 Clutch Hub is formed is it's not all done in one stage. We have several stages which we use to form it. The first one is what we call ring forming. So we just put a little groove in the top. Uh, these are just some basic animations of my simulations. Uh, and this is just to center it on the tools. The next stage is we pull the material down and we form it into a can or the hub shape um, just to get that general clutch, clutch geometry. And then after this, we do a quick spring back analysis and then we manually trim and pierce all the lubrication holes in the windows. Following that, we have our only hot forming stage. Um, the hot forming stage adds a little groove in the top and it adds the splines all the way around. Now, typically, this is quite indicative of real world scenarios because we only do use one hot forming stage most of the time because it doesn't make sense to transition your microstructure and then re it and do it again. So typically, there's only one of these and that's the same for this process. So the way we do these simulations is we get our tooling geometry from Magna, which typically looks something like this. Now this CAD is going to have everything we need to construct that tool, but of course, because we're doing a numerical solution, we have the luxury of just being able to constrain degrees of freedom. So what we can do is we can get rid of a lot of the unnecessary parts that we don't need for our analysis. And then moving forward on that same vein, we can continue to, to constrain certain degrees of freedom and we can use symmetry constraints. So this specific model actually has quarter symmetry, meaning that we can pretty much get rid of 75% of the model and have no negative effects on our accuracy. And then following that, we take that model, we mesh the surfaces of the tool, and then we add in elements of the blank. Now, one of the other things we need to be aware of is that most tools in manufacturing don't just have two things coming down at the same speed. There's a lot of relative movement in the tools, and this is created through the use of dye springs or nitrogen gas springs. And just like any other spring, this just gives us displacement-dependent reaction, uh, reaction forces. But if we don't model these correctly, then of course our simulation is not going to be very accurate. So I took the two models of gas springs that we do use for this specific can forming, and I just tested 10 different points, and then I applied a fourth order curve fitting equation to those and imported into my simulation. Um, now, one of the things we need to be very, very mindful of is runtime. Runtime can be very, very out of hand with these kinds of problems. So a can forming simulation can take about a week to solve, which isn't too bad. But a hot spline forming simulation can take about two and a half months. So I don't really know what I'm doing a lot of the times, I'm going to be honest. And you know what? It's not going to work right off the bat. So eventually, you're iterating, you're iterating, and if it's taking you two and a half months to iterate, 
that's not really going to be very feasible to do these kinds of simulations. So we need to find a method to decrease this runtime, otherwise this project is not feasible. So what I did was I actually looked at the mechanics of what's going on. Now, we're using shell elements pretty typically for these kinds of simulations, but if we use shell elements, they're modeled as a triangular element or a quadrilateral element that's infinitely thin. And that's not really good if we're trying to do a thickness analysis. So what we do is we add what's called Gauss integration points. And these Gauss integration points allow us to get closer and closer to that theoretical surface. They have an asymptotic behavior, so we can keep adding more and more of them, but they'll never actually get to the surface. So we do tend to see diminishing returns after using a bunch of them. Now, what I did was I did a quick analysis using two all the way to 10 integration points, and I ran some simulations and looked at the results of the accuracy. And I found that after about five integration points, we saw diminishing returns, and this is pretty consistent with the literature. So after that, though, you do get a linearly increasing amount of runtime, so it makes sense not to max out that integration point number. Now, the other thing we can look at is the time step size. So as I said before, an explicit analysis allows us to look at the intermediate states, but it also says if we have a 10 second scenario in the real world, we may divide that up into 100 millisecond chunks. But we need to figure out a way of deciding on what number is appropriate. So the way we do that is if we look at our mesh, let's do a line mesh here. We're gonna have our elements. Okay, so this is our mesh. We're gonna have a pressure wave or a sound wave propagate through here. If our time step, dt, is this length, then we're not losing any information because this pressure wave hasn't had time to travel through the mesh and affect the adjacent element. However, if we size our time step to be this large, then we're missing information. So what we're essentially trying to do with this equation C is figure out the speed at which a pressure wave would propagate through each element, and then based on the size of the smallest element, figure out the minimum or the maximum time step that we can use. Now, the only way we can get around this is we can change the density. So as we can see, density does have an effect on the speed of sound. So if we increase the density, we can increase our time step. Now, what we could do is we could just manually scale the density. If we don't do any scaling whatsoever, it takes about 198 hours to solve this problem. But if we just arbitrarily scale by 1,000 times and increase the mass of this object 1,000 times what it would normally be, we can increase or decrease that runtime from about 200 hours all the way down to about 7 hours. The problem with this is that even though I've manually scaled the density up, the algorithm will still go through and it'll look at the smallest element and it'll calculate the time step based on that and then we have a bunch of elements with artificially high density that are just contributing to inertial effects for no reason. But something that's much more efficient is we can use a DT2MS algorithm which basically allows us to choose a target time step. What do we want our time step to be? And then it will go through the mesh and it will size each specific element's density appropriately in order to achieve that time step. And if we do that, we can bring our time all the way down from seven hours to under two hours. So moving into some initial results, uh, as this is a thermal simulation, we do want to look at the quench rate. So this allows us to see the different temperatures that we're getting relative to time. And then of course we can plot this on an xy axis. So what we can see here, this is the top of the part has a good cooling rate. As we move down the part, closer to the bottom ring, we get slower and slower cooling. And this yellow line right here represents the martensite start temperature, and then martensite end, and then the minimum rate that we need in order to achieve this. So we can see that at the very bottom of the part, we're really on the cusp of what was necessary to get full transition. Uh, the other things we can look at are thickness. Now thickness is a really, really good way of actually validating the mechanical side of our model. So we can see that as we're stretching uh, the part, as we're forming it, we get local uh, bunching up and we get thinning in certain areas. So this will give us basically how thick it is in certain locations. What we can do is we can take a physical part, so one that we've actually stamped in reality, we can define locations and then correlate those with elements, and then we can actually look at the distribution of thicknesses between the experimental model and the numerical model. And you can see we actually have quite good agreement. And Note the scale is quite small here. We're looking at about <clears throat> four millimeters up from top to bottom. So the other thing we can do to validate our model is we can look at how the lubrication holes stretch. Is this running? Yeah. So because we quench the material, because it becomes so strong, all of our piercing operations, our trimming operations, need to be done before the heat treatment stage. And so what happens is we need to poke all the holes before we actually form the splines. When we do this, 
we get kind of an overlying behavior on these lubrication holes, which isn't ideal, but it gives us a way of validating our model, model further. So if we look at the experimental result, we can see that the average major diameter for this hole is about 4.2 millimeters. And of course, after simulation, we see being 4.14 millimeters. So we're getting almost a 99% geometric.